thank you, Professor Rogers, and we're very appreciative of you taking the time to be with us this morning. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Thomas J. Tobin, with his keynote address, Universal Design for Learning is the Key to Campus Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And it's fabulous to have you here with us today, Tom. I'm Tom. Hi, everybody. Now, I'm grateful to University College Dublin for inviting me to come and work with you all today. I want to say thank you especially to President Rogers, to Dr. Anna Kelly, to Julie. Um, Daniel was over there helping out with captions. There's Fiona. Let's see, who we got? We got Angela taking photos here. We've got the tech team over there. Um, let's see, Enya, Roisin. Karen's doing our captions today. We have a whole raft of people who are helping us to be successful today. And that is actually the theme that we want to put forward for everyone. You individually can take a number of steps to help lower barriers and make a smooth experience for everyone. And individually, you can only do so much. There are only so many hours in the day. You also have families to take care of. You have service opportunities that you're working on. You have your work here at your job. And all of that can be a lot. So what I'd like to suggest today is that together, we can do a lot more than we can do individually. And I want to make you two promises today. Promise number one, you will leave our sessions today, not just this keynote, but also our sessions with our faculty experts with practical things that you can do tomorrow to help lower barriers and make things a little easier and smoother for the learners whom you serve and for yourself. Promise number one. Promise number two. You will also leave here today with language that you can use to help speak to the people who aren't able to join us. I want to say welcome to everyone who's here in the room and to our friends who are joining us online, as well as everyone who's going to be watching the recording later on. With that, let's do a little bit of housekeeping to get us started. I need to take care of three things. One, my partner came with me on my trip to Ireland. Uh, we really love being here in Dublin. But uh, she needs a little bit of evidence that I'm actually here doing my work because she's having a spa day today. Yes, I'm jealous. So for those of you here in the room, if you would like not to be photographed, please hold up your packet over your face. Yes, I know about GDPR. And, and for the rest of you, just wave hello to Marianne. And awesome, thank you so much. All right, now that bit of housekeeping is out of the way. The second thing I need to take care of, as we're going along in the next hour, please know that I am interruptible. If something we're talking about sparks a question or an idea, I'm gonna ask Fiona and Daniel uh, with the folks online, if somebody posts something in the chat feature that uh, seems relevant or you've got something to just uh, say, just come on the mic microphone when we have a pause point and we'll address it. If you're here in the room, just raise your hand and share. There's also another way to be during our session today. Take some notes for yourself. Online people, just lurk. You don't have to be an active voice today to get benefit out of what we're doing. I'll also pull the curtain back a little bit. What I'm trying to practice right now is an example of universal design for learning, offering people choices about how they take action and how they interact. On your screen being pro projected now is the title of my talk. It says Universal Design for Learning is the key to campus, uh, campus EDI, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And there's a smiling photo of me, the UCD logo, and the University for All name for today. So it's been a minute since we've been peopling, hasn't it? Right? This is the first time we've been able to do University for All in a live, in-person setting. And as we get back into the 
before times ideas of what a class is like, what a symposium is like. We should not lose the idea of the gains that we've had as we become Zoom people and email people and online people and socially distanced people. The pandemic, rough it has, as it has been and tragic as it has been for many people, also has taught us good lessons. And we can take those lessons into our future interactions with one another. On your screen is three images. The pandemic illness is not the only reason why we should adopt an attitude of inclusion. There's a car driving through a raging forest fire in the Western United States. This is a recent reason why the University of California system went to temporary remote classwork for its students over a period of two weeks, it had nothing to do with the pandemic. There's another image there of people protesting for the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements. We've had a social awakening that a lot of folks in our environments have been getting a raw deal for years. I'm grateful to know that a number of our colleagues, when I had a chance to talk with folks before we started up today, specifically mentioned their outreach to the traveling community here in Ireland. Being open and welcoming to people who have different ways of living and being is the way that we're going to help continue that social mission of our institutions. And on your screen is a man wearily looking at the camera, wearing a mask in a coffee shop. Yes, there's been a pandemic. It's still kind of going on. And when we have a chance to have social time later, you'll probably see me in a mask. I have a high risk human at home, so I want to be doubly careful about how I'm interacting with other folks. What that means though is in the before times, we just expected that students would show up to lecture diligently taking notes in person during a particular time. We still offer those things. And what keeps uh, administrators like Dr. Rogers up at night are questions like, are we a campus if the idea of a campus is changing? What is our identity as an institution if it's not buildings and beautiful waterworks and statues? What is our identity as a group? So as we're thinking, I'd like to ask you to, to do a little bit of a, a thought exercise with me. On your screen now is a university president at graduation. This is what administrators love to see. These are the images we like to show about ourselves. People graduating. This is a graduation scene. The president is giving a socially distanced fist bump to a recent graduate. And what I'd like to offer is the folks who are here as part of University for All, we all recognize, and I hope that we share, the sense that lowering barriers to access for as many people as possible, welcoming in as many people as possible, is both a socially just thing to do and a keep the paychecks coming thing to do as well. More successful students equals a more successful institution. But that's not in the brains of everyone on campus yet. So what I'd love for you to do, we'll put two minutes of music on in just a moment. And for those of you online, please post something in the chat or just keep it to yourself, write down a note. If you're watching the recording, now is a good time to pause and think. And if you're here in the room, either take some notes for yourself or if you'd like, we have a microphone that we can pass around and have some comments after that thinking time is done. If you had five minutes to talk with a leader on your campus or a colleague, and they're saying things like, boy, I miss the old days when I just showed up and lectured. If you, people in the room are laughing, so I think I may have touched a nerve there. If you had five minutes to talk with somebody who thinks like that, what might you say to that person that would help bring them around to that more inclusive, more let's design things well, mindset. You're going to see me switch over to my media player here. 
And I'll put two minutes of music on for thinking. Once the two minutes is up, we'll see what's come in through the chat, and we'll open it up for the microphone here in the room as well. So here's two minutes of music for thinking. So I'm noticing a couple of things as we're wrapping up our thinking time here. Colleagues online, you may not hear this, but the folks in the room, um, I didn't tell them they could cheat, but they totally cheated. I heard people talking to their friends and discussing the idea. And by the way, it's not cheating. That's how this kind of conversation should be going. And even if you're doing a completely asynchronous online event, this is the kind of opportunity that the chat allows us to have. Many people have gotten used to the idea of having a side channel where you can talk about what the speaker is saying, where you can interrogate, say, that's baloney, say, I like that, say, does anybody else have this idea, or have a completely separate side channel. For those of you who are used to being in a lecture hall, in the before times, if students were in the back talking about something else, how rude. But now we recognize that oftentimes it's that immediate thinking and commentary that actually leads to cementing good ideas, taking good notes, being able to continue a conversation in a productive and participatory way. Speaking of which, do we have ideas and comments from folks online? Um, we do have an interesting comment here, and I think it ties in really nicely, Tom, what you're saying there, what might have been traditionally rude, which was that one of our colleagues, Tara, is saying that she loves the idea of interruptibility, um, and how do you use that in large lectures, and how do you manage it? Because I suppose traditionally that would have been seen as rude, but very important. Absolutely, and one of the, one of the differences in the educational systems and traditions uh, from the European model, the North American model, and then the Asian model, is in the Asian model, you do not ever speak to, in front of, or around your instructor. It is absolutely a breach of protocol. Move west a little bit into the European model, where you have a separate lecture, and then you have tutoring hours or sessions where it's more interactive. So why would we take precious lecture time when I get to be the superstar and tell you what you need to know and have that be participatory or something that it has student voices in it? That's a shift, and it's an ongoing shift. Some of us have moved in that direction, others of us have not. And then in the North American model, um, 
we actually don't pay anybody else other than the lecturer, so it's just that person. And it's that person's responsibility to make sure that the students have got the information, the skills, and the knowledge. So excellent comment, thank you. Does anyone in the room want to share what you thought about what you would say to your colleague to help them move in a more inclusive direction? Put a hand up and we'll give you the microphone. There's another statistic while we're getting the microphone around to everyone. When you ask, are there any questions? Most lecturers will wait an average of six seconds <laughs> before they say, oh no, great, I'll move on with my lecture. Um, six seconds is not enough time to actually think, which is why I use those music cues and why um, in, the, in the beginning of our session, our audiovisual folks said, oh, you don't want the audience to see the media player, do you? I said, yes, I do, because I want you to see what I'm doing. Please, there's a comment up here. Okay. Uh, hello, Tom. Lovely to meet you. My name is Tina Lowe, and I work in the Access and Lifelong Learning Center. Grant. So the first thing I would say is that it would revolutionize lecture, lecturers because it would make them stop uh, kind of monotonely speaking at lectures, right? Um, they'd have to think about what they say. They couldn't just read it off or bottom 100 years the same lecture. So, and it would, I think it would make their lives a million times more interesting because then they'd have to stop and think, well, what am I actually saying here? And they'd have to allow people with lots of different disabilities, different diversities, different ways of learning to uh, interrupt them and to say, actually, I can't follow you. I don't know what you're saying. Could you read out your slides, which I went here to UCD in 1997, and I used to sit up in where I am now, but it was actually, this is much more comfortable, in fairness. Uh, in the Newman building, and we used to call it the Royal Box. So we used to wave at the lecturers and try and interrupt them. And I think it's actually a brilliant idea, mainly for lecturers, to make them think about what they're talking about, actually. Fair. Fantastic comment. Thank you for, for the story behind it as well. Those of you folks online, uh, you didn't get the joke that some folks laughed at. Um, our colleague is way up in the back uh, in what she refers to as the comfy seats. And, uh, and it used to be that you had to sort of wave and try to get the lecturer's attention. So being interruptible or telling your colleagues, hey, have you considered uh, that your students who get poor marks on the tests and examinations, that there are things you can do during lecture in order to help not have to do reteaching, re-lecturing, lots of intensive work with your students. Fantastic comment. Do we have another from online? Um, we do have some comments um, that I might bring together, which are just very much in favor of um, hybrid mm. teaching. Um, and we have one colleague in Smurfish, who, it, which is the graduate business school here in UCD. Um, and they're currently looking at developing, you know, their a master's program, which would give the students the option to take it in person a combination of online and in-person or a completely online. Um, and how do you simplify this process? <laughs> is, uh, is, I think that are simple, uh, find, sorry, how are, to, how are we to make the choices in participation mode simpler across all of our programs and courses? Um, and another colleague also very much in favor of this online and hybrid way of going. Ah, fantastic. So if you had a few minutes with one of your colleagues who is a little skeptical, you would say, we should adopt a hybrid model. And as Dr. Rogers said in his introduction, uh, it, it is a challenge, right? All you need is a professional media team over here off camera, and you need a professional camera person up there, and uh, then you can, and somebody to monitor the chat, and then, you know, it's perfect as a lecturer. All I need is six other people, and it works perfectly fine. At the same time, when we think about hybrid, it doesn't have to be a great big media production. Hybrid can be as simple as having a microphone in class, being logged in on your laptop into a remote session like we're using Zoom today, and every once in a while, yourself as the lecturer checking in to see if people are working in the chat or have questions that they've raised. 
It doesn't have to be teaching to the people out there and teaching to the people in here and trying to juggle that attention. Give the same lecture, the same kind of interactions in your classrooms and put boundaries around what you can accomplish as an individual person. Remember promise number one, here's one thing you can do tomorrow. One thing you can do tomorrow is for every class session, establish a Zoom link or establish a chat. Give your students the ability to come in remotely and tell them the expectation is please come to the live session if and when you are able. And if you're not, please participate remotely. One of the challenges at every symposium conference and course that we offer is when we record the sessions, people don't show up, right? Oh, well, I, I, maybe I'll watch the recording later. Later never comes. <laughs> I've got a list of 26 things that I needed to watch from 2004. <laughs> and the list gets longer as we go along. So the challenge when we're thinking about these five minute messages is how do we make things less overwhelming and I have to do all of the things or I'm going to be weighed down by them and more, I can actually take an action. We have time for, for one more comment from folks in the room here and I know we won't get to everybody's ideas. We had a, a, a hand up here in the second row here. Hi, um, so I'm coming in from a slightly different angle, so I'm an ed tech um, in TUS, formerly LIT, um, and I'm kind of working with UDL in my college, and mm -hmm. the way I would kind of go around like helping getting people on board would be like, how can I make your life easier, but also like, how could it, for example, solve a reoccurring problem? So let's say you have, I don't know, biology class, or, and they don't get something, second years always struggle with this, mm -hmm. then you kind of brainstorm about like how you'd solve that. That's how I go about it anyway. So if I'm reading between the lines, Tommy, in your comment, um, you at, instead of saying, here is a tray with technology and practices, see which ones you like, your approach is, tell me about the interactions that you have now and which of them are not going the way that you had planned. Basically. And they define the problem. Yeah. Awesome. And you, you kind of tailor it based on that then. I love it. I owe you like five euro for setting me up okay. so well. <laughs> and and uh, this, this is where I, it, I, I miss the in-person conferences. I promised our tech team I wouldn't go running up into the audience, but I really want to give you a high five right now. <laughs> and if you're willing, we'll, we'll just do the, the air version of it. Uh, because this is one of the lessons to take away from this entire symposium. We can come with a message to our campus and only some people will hear it. We can come by asking questions and listening to the scenarios and problems and challenges that our colleagues define for themselves. And when we say, let me help you work through that, let me help you lower the barrier for yourself. Let me help you with that problem. Then they're listening to you. And as we think about universal design for learning advocacy on our campuses, it's going from the bullhorn on your screen to a listening ear. On your screen is the actress Sharina Clanton. Those of you who follow Australian soap operas will recognize her. Um, she is speaking through a bullhorn at an Aboriginal rights demonstration in Melbourne, Australia. So when we're talking about equity, diversity, inclusion, one of the challenges is that equity, diversity, and inclusion, EDI, is often framed in terms of ethnic, social, economic justice. What we seldom hear about, but equally important, is the challenge of people who have disability barriers in their lives. People who are caring for small children or their aging parents. 
people who are doing military service, people who have work commitments, people who have unexpected challenges crop up in their lives. And that's all of us. On the taxi ride over here, the taxi driver was very friendly and she asked, well, what are you doing at the university? I said, I'm giving a talk on accessibility, on universal design for learning. And she said, oh, that, that benefits people with autism, doesn't it? And I said, yes. And she says, yeah, my, two of my grandbabies have autism and I'm very proud of them. They can sing the, they're out three years old now and they can sing the alphabet backwards faster than they can forwards. And she's so proud of the intelligence that her grandchildren exhibit. Ask anyone in the room and you can find someone who has some kind of difference or challenge. That's what EDI is all about when we are thinking about lowering barriers for people. So promise number two was how do we talk to our colleagues? We do exactly what Tommy said in the beginning. We don't come with the message. We don't come with tools on a tray. We come with that listening ear. Now on your screen is the official definition of universal design for learning. This is from the neuroscientists at CAST, the Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. They discovered back in the late 1990s that when we learn anything, whether we're six years old or we're 60, we have to activate three different chemical pathways in our brains. Now, I'm not going to go into the acetylcholine uptake pathway through the hippocampus. Karen, with your captioning, I'm very sorry. Okay. But we can go there. We can talk about how when learning sticks and whether we're learning how to change a pipe under our kitchen sink because it has burst or whether we're learning about differential calculus. Anything. We have to have a why a reason to learn it. When the pipe has burst under my kitchen sink, I have a real urgent reason to learn how, where my shutoff valve is and how to fix that. We need to have a what. We need to know the information that helps us. We need to know the processes. And we need to have a how. We need to be able to practice, to try things out, to get things wrong and come back and understand why we thought that way in the first place so that we can adopt better practices and increase our knowledge. The why, the what, and the how, on your screen are a number of students studying around a table. They're all looking at a screen that uh, is out of picture. One of them is standing and pointing at the screen. Another student has hands on a keyboard. Another student has a mobile device out. Another student has a laptop. And these students are studying together and this is the official definition of universal design for learning. Provide learners with multiple means of getting engaged and staying engaged with the learning. How do we keep students going? How do we help them to be prepared to learn? Promise number one, what can you do tomorrow? Put a time estimate on the activities you ask your students to do. This isn't the entirety of it, but it really works well. If you ask your students to do some preparatory reading before lecture, how long will it take them to read that journal article, that particular piece? If you ask your students to do some practice activity before they come into your lab environment, how long will it take them to do that? Now, how do you know how to estimate that time? A completely non-scientific but still useful way to do it? You do the activity and then give your students 50% more time. If it took you 30 minutes to read that in-depth journal article, tell your students estimated reading time 45 minutes and they'll be very pleasantly surprised if they come in under. If it takes you 25 minutes to write that one page reflection about a particular aspect of your course. And that's one of the assignments for your students. If it took you 15 minutes, or excuse me, if it took you 20, tell your students 30. If it took you 15, tell them 22 and a half. You don't have to do it in a scientific way, but tell them about half again as much more time. 
The next part of UDL is the what. And we're actually pretty good at doing this now. This is what we often think about when we think about accessibility. This is putting captions on your videos. This is having a text transcript for audio podcast or, or recorded verbal speech. This is using alternative text to describe images that you post into your learning management system. Excuse me, I'm in, I'm in Europe. Virtual learning environment, or VLE. And this is describing what's on the screen when you're doing lecture, like I've been doing. This is giving information in more than one way. Why is this useful? If your learners in lecture are studying and writing notes diligently, they might not be looking at the screen when you are describing something important for them to remember. Your students who are coming in remotely, hello folks on Zoom, they might be, oh, I don't know, preparing lunch, getting their children ready to go off to school, and they're just listening. So this is an opportunity to give people information in more than one channel. Someone somewhere will be thinking right now, this sounds like a lot of work. And they wouldn't be wrong. How do we turn this from, I, want, I have to do all the alternatives into just another thing? Instead of trying to anticipate, well, I might have a student who's deaf, I might have a student with a visual challenge, I might have a student uh, who's housing insecure, I might have a student who is taking care of small children at home, I might have a student who needs to be present and absent because of medical needs. Instead of trying to anticipate every single possibility, which would drive us crazy and be too much burnout kind of work, instead adopt a plus one mindset. If there's one way for an interaction to happen now, make one more way. Will this reach absolutely everyone? Maybe not. Is it a step in a very good direction? Yes. And you will find that people who come with that piece of paper for disability services and individual accommodations, you'll have fewer of those. The idea behind what Dr. Rogers started us out with today is that by adopting that universal design mindset in our physical spaces and a universal design for learning, or UDL mindset, in our interactions, we are actually saving ourselves time and effort. Because let's face it, accommodations doing one change one time for one person it's the right thing to do, and it's a lot of work. It's also effort that we don't see coming. People come to us and say, you know, I, I really do need this accommodation. And so we can't really prepare for that ahead of time. So doing the inclusive design work now is effort that pays us back. Promise number two, that's something to share with your colleagues. And the last part of universal design for learning that's on your screen right now is multiple ways of, it says, demonstrating skill. The official language says multiple means of action and expression. But how do we ask our students to show us what they know? Is there more than one way? Lecturers and graders, are you or have you ever been tired of marking 40 of the same essay. By the time you're on essay number 32, you wonder if there's a university policy that disallows you from keeping a bottle of something in your desk drawer. Okay. I used to be that way. I, I, I teach English literature and English composition. So when I would ask students to write an essay, and it was freshman grading and marking time, I would see the same challenges, the same infelicities, the same mistakes over and over and over again. By the time I got through marking a bunch of papers, I was worn out. UDL asks us, give people more than one way that they can show what they know. In my English courses, 
my students have to know how to write and how to format something in a written way. So the end product is a written essay. So I don't give them choice on that final thing. But as they're practicing, you bet I give them choices. I want them to practice writing a paragraph that has a thesis sentence and uses details, evidence, and examples to support it. And that practice, go ahead and write it out using Microsoft Word or a word processor. But also, you can just speak it out loud during a class period. Or you can take out your mobile phone and use the voice recorder and record that and send that file to me through the VLE. Those are both ways that I can use the same criteria for marking and give you feedback. All the while knowing that the end result is that written essay. So if the format is what you're marking on, I can't tell if you have proper margins and Times New Roman 12 point font and double spacing in a, a verbal message. If the final format is part of your marking, yeah, don't give your students an option. Everywhere else that you can give students that plus one about how they take action, how they show what they know, how they practice, find those places. And we were talking about EDI. On your screen is the type of diversity that makes it into the marketing brochure. Here are six students, all smiling. We have students from all different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, they're, you know, the, the backpacks, the gelled hair, the I'm so glad to be on campus. It's even autumn and it's a sunny day, right? This is the kind of diversity that is in that marketing brochure. When we are talking about diversity, though, we can actually reframe what we want to say. And here I'd like to pause and ask, does anyone have a burning question, want to make a comment, or just share what is in your mind right now related to the, co the topics that we're talking about? We'll take another 20 minutes or so and we'll have a formal Q&A session after this, but I want to pause here and see what's in your mind. I'm not going to play any music, but I'll pause for about 30 seconds here. And uh, if there's ideas coming in in the chat or anyone would like to share a story or a question or a comment or what's going on in your head, I'd love to hear from you. Or if, you, or if you had a question from last time and it's still sticking with you, we'll, we'll pick that back up. I'll have some quiet here. And here in the room, there's a, a comment here and then all the way up top in the back and then we'll come to our online friends. Hello. Whoop. You got it. There we go. Hi. No, I just thought this was really interesting because I was working on a project this week with a colleague and we're putting a booklet together for academic advisory for mature students. And the marketing people came back with these incredible images and they all looked a bit like this. And uh, they don't seem to have them in their stockpile, the real images. And we were trying to say, we want these images of mature students. So I'm going, can we not get a cluttered kitchen table of a student with a child in the background or someone getting on a bus? But we really struggled. Uh, and twice we looked for the images and they're a great company in their work, but they don't seem to have the real images on file. Ah, fantastic comment. And something you can do tomorrow, talk with your marketing colleagues and ask them to get a subscription to the image databases that include people who look like your students and the students whom you want to attract, like returning adult learners, like people who are working from home and caring for small children. There are, and they're, they're not usually in the big Getty database, but there are specific image databases of people with disabilities studying, of people who have caregiving responsibilities and they have their textbooks and notebooks open. There was a comment up here in the back and then we'll come to our friends online too. Hi, Thomas. Um, it's about a dilemma and uh, due to combination of my astrological sign, genetics, and uh, 
cultural influences. I'm a kind of a guy of dilemmas. So a dilemma I've been facing as a teacher and educator, and, and uh, you know, it, I kind of it bubbled up here as I'm listening to you and reflecting, is the challenge versus accommodation. The catering versus building resilience. Now, they don't have to be contradictory, but you know, at certain stage, and I have to say, I teach mostly masters level, um, but at certain stage, I started including a sentence in my syllabus, which is like a bloody little booklet by now, um, about expect to be frustrated. And you know, I don't mind, I mean, I don't aim to frustrate my students, they may disagree, but I don't mind if they get frustrated if it's part of their learning. So, you know, I care about transformation and it involves challenge. So, for example, sometimes students will choose to do what's easier, not coming sometimes? to campus. <laughs> okay, let's I'm, keep going. Well, yeah, no, I'm fairly optimistic. And, but for me, it would be the wrong, even if I can do it, it would be the wrong choice in terms of their optimal learning. So your thoughts on that, et cetera. I, I love the way you framed that comment. Thank you very much. And if I'm reading between the lines, let me see if I can summarize what I've heard. I want my students to encounter difficult and challenging concepts. I want them to struggle with things. I want to give them opportunities to get it wrong, have the mess of learning and then together we figure out where to go from there. And my colleague just gave me a thumbs up on that summary. You have put your finger on something that promise number two, how do we talk to our colleagues who are not here? Our colleagues who are not here might not be as generous as the person who just made the comment. Our colleagues who are not here might say something very similar for different reasons. If I water down my content, am I holding my students to expectations that they will then be unprepared for the real world of their jobs? If I make things easier for my students, am I no longer guarding the ivory tower of knowledge? Have I somehow abdicated my responsibility to be a rigorous person? Will our degrees mean less when people go and say, I want to get a job? You didn't say any of those things, and I don't think you think those things. But those things are in the minds of many of our colleagues. Here is a disheartening and then a heartening statement. Disheartening statement. Accessibility, equity, diversity, and inclusion do require us to make things easier for our students. So your colleagues who are saying rigor, 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 when you say that, they will already tune you out. Heartening statement. Yes, universal design for learning is making things easier on your students and it is dumbing down your content if you're doing it wrong. <laughs> the mistake that a lot of people can make is that we want to keep the challenge and the rigor of our subject matter high. We want our students to encounter challenges, obstacles, difficult things. And we want to help them do those difficult things and be sitting inside the challenges with us. What we want to lower is not the rigor of our content, but the, the need to get access, the ability to get access to the materials and the interactions in the first place. Keep the difficult journal article reading, but give your students another way to get access to that information. Is there an audio version of that? that they could listen to while they're in their car or on the tram traveling to and from work or to and from campus. Keep the challenges in your science lab, but give students another way to show that result. 
or allow them to predict what's going on. Those of you who teach public speaking or business, is there a way that your students can give that business presentation live in front of the class or turn their selfie camera on their phones to good use and have it record them and then they can play the video and you still get to have commentary from yourself and classmates. There's lots of different ways that we can address that and thank you for the comment and for framing it in such a generous way. We've got maybe one more comment from folks online too. What's going on? We have one comment here that says, do you think offering options of assessment and going beyond just options of practice for learners is too much? Ooh, good <laughs> comment. And our, our colleague online is, is following on from the kind of conversation we just had. Assessment, this is the sticking point, right? If you've been giving your multiple choice examinations for the last 26 years, <clears throat> he said heavily, the challenge becomes, is a multiple choice examination the best way for people to show what they know? Oftentimes not. You can design multiple choice tests in a way that is psychologically and, excuse me, psychometrically valid. But most of us aren't psychometricians. Most of us, we take the test banks from the publisher or we create our own tests. So when we are thinking about assessment, Promise number one, what you can do tomorrow. Divide assessment of learning from assessment for learning. Assessment of learning is, now we're at the end of this concept, show me what you know. And if you have a way to give your students a plus one for that, fantastic. If you can mark it using the same criteria, the same rubric, the same grading scale, that's the key there. But that's assessment of learning. That's our, the traditional marking that we often do. What I'd suggest is look for opportunities in your systems and your individual work for assessment as learning. Give your students a test at the end of the first part of the learning. Then mark it for them, but don't count that mark. Don't put it into the official record. Use that mark as a means of helping your students understand what they need to focus on now and what they have strengths in now. Having those marks before it counts allows your students to understand when they're going off the rails and be able to come back. Let's them say, oh, I should stop in and talk with my lecturer or my tutor, or I should connect with my classmates so that I can have a conversation and get more information in time for them to be able to do well on their tests and examinations. How many of us have heard colleagues say things like, if a certain percentage of my students don't fail, I'm not rigorous enough. If I'm not grading on a curve, there must be winners and there must be losers. That's before times thinking, honestly. If we are going to be open and welcoming to everyone and then we kick a third of them out when they get here, that is not the way to go. If you want to be open and welcoming to everyone, the idea to adopt is how do we support everyone to be successful? So that was promise number one, learning, excuse me, assessment of learning versus assessment as learning. A little concept to think about as you hear the other presenters here at Symposium. Think about that. Um, I, I met Ernesto earlier. He's going to give one of our final talks today. He's going to be talking about that in, in addition to some other ideas. Now, on your screen is a controversial image. It's the same image as a couple of slides ago. It's the students studying together around a table, and it's the definition of universal design for learning. But this time, it's got a big red circle with a slash through it, indicating don't do that. I have to be careful when I say what I am about to say next. Please, colleagues online and colleagues in the room, 
do not go around saying, the expert Tom Tobin told me we can ignore people with disabilities. Don't do that. But what I want to say is, when we say universal design for learning, our colleagues can make an easy mental mistake. They can think that we are talking only about students who have disability barriers in their environments. They picture the student with the dark glasses and the cane to get around. They picture the student in the wheelchair. They picture the student who has the service dog. They picture the student who has a motor challenge. What they tend not to picture are the students who have invisible disability barriers. What they don't picture are the students who don't have reliable transportation. What they don't picture are the students whose kids just got COVID because they're under five and they have to stay home for a while in quarantine. What they don't picture are the students who have caregiving responsibilities for their own aging parents, and that's an unpredictable thing. So when we want to work systemically, not just ones and twos of us, but when we're talking about an entire department, an entire school, an entire university, adopting universal design for learning, we shouldn't first or only talk about disability populations of students. That's the statement that I have to be very careful in stating because we risk erasure. It is not my intent to erase a population of students who needs all the visibility and advocacy that they can get because they have been discriminated against and have not had similar opportunities to others for so, so long. But when we talk about accessibility, people will make that mental mistake. So I'd like to replace that narrative with one that is for everybody. And I'd like to do it through the lens of your mobile device. I'm holding up my phone right now. On your screen are a number of UCD graduates. This also makes it into the marketing brochure. It's where I got the image. And they are in their caps and gowns. They're throwing their caps in the air. And they're celebrating graduating from UCD. What are the things that always get funded? Dr. Rogers talked about uh, the uh, higher education funding from the national government. And he made, uh, a, in passing, he said, it could be better. And then he went on. You all caught that, right? We always advocate for funding things that are mission critical for our institutions. When you have the ear of your ministers, when you are talking to people who are politically connected or people who help with budgeting or help to fund programs that you fund, what always gets funded? Here is the secret language to use. Promise number two, how do we talk to others? Persistence. More students are here on day one, and they're still here to take the final examination. Retention. More students come in this term and take a class with me, and then come back next term and take a class with you. And satisfaction. More students report that their experience of being learners with us was a good one, and it helped them to be prepared for whatever next step they're going to take. Those are the things that get funding. And if you have data to show, before I did this universal design for learning or equity project, so many students stopped out before the end of the course. And now after we did this as a department, we have more students who stick with us. Those are data that show these efforts actually work. Those are the kinds of data that help to receive funding. Those are the kinds of data that later on when they release this report, you can use this with your own individual and department level data to help keep funding and support coming for your efforts. I'm holding up a book that says, Who Counts? University for All Data, Metrics, and Evidence, 2020 to 2021. They'll be releasing this later. I'm not even supposed to hold this up. It's not official yet. OK. So when we talk about universal design for learning, let's wrap this up. 
persistence, retention, satisfaction. This is the kind of image that your marketing folks will want to share. These are 16 people standing across a street uh, in some nondescript town, and we see different kinds of variety among them. So we have ethnic variety. We have folks getting around in wheelchairs. There's a person who has a guide dog. This is the kind of diversity that we are after, the visible and the invisible part. Make your universal design for learning policies and statements echo the language that's already in your EDI policies as well. Align them so that that's the kind of work that everybody does at the institution. On your screen, this is the type of student whom we serve. Here is a woman at home on her couch. She has a book bag and a textbook open. She's writing in her notebook, and her young son is asleep on her lap, hugging his stuffed animal to his chest. And when we think about promise number two, how do we talk to our colleagues, there are four different types of access interactions. I've actually stopped talking about accessibility, the word, first, and I chop the end of the word off and I just talk about access. Because when we say access, it's our students out there on their mobile devices. Do you know the statistics? Throughout all of Ireland, 93% of adults own a smartphone. Yes, even your 82-year-old gran has one but only about 40% of households report that they have a laptop or a desktop with an internet connection at home. How are your students studying when they are away from the formal spaces that we have with them together? It's on their mobile. And they're not doing that by choice. Uh, universe, excuse me, Oregon State University in the United States did a global survey of more than 3,000 colleges and universities and their students. And what they discovered was lots of students own mobile phones, but overwhelmingly prefer to work on laptops, desktop computers, or tablet devices. They just don't own them. It's an affordability question for most people. So, when we think about how do students have access to the materials, this is the accessibility we know about. This is posting things in the VLE. This is creating alternative versions of content and materials. But also, how do they get access to one another when they're outside of our formal spaces? Friends online, you've been having a robust side chat and you have access to each other right now. How do they get access to us as an institution? How do they know to go talk to the librarians, to our IT support people, to our mental health counselors, to our career counselors, to our guidance friends? How do they know that? And how do they connect with our communities? How are they in service to the people and places where if they're going to get a job later on, let's connect them to those folks. On your screen are some students who are studying at a table. One of them has a book open, one of them's on a laptop, and one of them has a mobile phone. And there's another student here in a different area working quietly by themselves with a laptop open. So one last try here, and then we'll open up for some Q&A and wrap up. Um, if you'd like to talk to your leaders now, on your screen are some faculty members at a faculty senate meeting. They have microphones in front of them. One person is speaking into the microphone. I'd like you to take two minutes and write down your ideas toward one of these things. There are three possibilities on the screen. Depending on your role and your preferences, Describe an implementation of universal design for learning that you could do at an individual level or even better, at the level of your department, your group, your team, your school. Or put your leadership hat on. Be the person who has to give the green light to that kind of project. And what kind of inclusive projects would you like to see if you were in charge? Or where do you see your existing equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts? Where do you see opportunities where you could broaden the scope of those? So I'm gonna put two minutes of music on. 
We'll bring some ideas in from our colleagues online and here in the room, and then we'll wrap up and open it up for our open Q&A period here. So here comes two minutes of music. All right, after two minutes, I imagine that you have been able to put together your 10-page executive summary and hand it in to your leader. No, I, but in two minutes, I hope that you've been able to come up with one idea. And if that buzz continues, that's fine, but I want to, I want to uh, favor our folks who are online. Thank you very much for being here today and remoting, remoting in. And what are some of the ideas that are coming out from our colleagues online? We'll take two of those. Um, well, we do have some questions that I'll hold for the question and answer mm -hmm. session, but a comment that was made um, was the challenge around time um, and how um, we need to protect time for UDL um, and to develop this. And it might be the only option, but it might not be a popular concept. Um, but also that um, they love the idea of putting on the music and giving time to think, <laughs> you know, so you have to protect that time. Ah, grand. And, and I love the idea of time. And this is a lesson to take away. Promise number one, what can you do? If you wanted to take an entire course and do all of the work for universal design for learning, making it more equitable, making it more inclusive, lowering the barriers, and just doing the analysis of all the different places where you could do that, you would suffer from analysis paralysis. And you wouldn't even do one thing because you would see the 826 things that you would need to do by tomorrow. You have my blessing not to wear yourself out trying to make everything accessible. But at the same time, don't let that be an excuse not to take action. Do one thing that you can do. Start with those pinch points. Where are the things that already aren't going the way that you had planned, to our colleague's comment from earlier? Those are the places where a little effort now pays you back later. So thank you for that comment. You said there was another, another comment you wanted to share there too. Um, and we had one suggestion that less money should be spent on glossy brochures and more money spent on student grants to buy their laptops, their tablets, and their Ooh. books. I, um, administrators, are you listening? 
Yeah, the, the comment was spend less money on glossy brochures and put more money towards student bursaries, uh, supporting students to purchase laptops and other technology. You also heard Dr. Rogers talk about moving away from tools into design. Just giving people technology does not solve our challenges. In fact, sometimes it raises new challenges. But if we give people technology and we are able to support them in how to use it, if we are thinking about the ways in which we all interact, that's the lesson to take away. There was a comment right here in the third row, and then we'll wrap up for today. About Hello. technology, even if people were provided with um, folding, um, folding keyboards to work with their phones, that, that's not quite a laptop, but it does make self-expression a lot easier, and it's a very inexpensive solution. I spent all this time working up my thumbs over the years so that I could type, and now they have Bluetooth keyboards that I can pick, put in my pocket and I can type things out with my phones. This is one example of good technology, and I'll also put a caution here. If we give everybody the latest and greatest technology, in six years, it is yesterday's news, right? Remember the big technology of 2012, the Palm Pilot. <laughs> no one has those anymore. The technology will change and evolve. Universal design for learning is not about the technology. You can do zero tech universal design for learning in your classrooms. I've been doing a bunch of it here, describing things on the screen, giving you more than one way to get access to the information. There, you have access to that handout for my session today that has all of my spoken notes and links and all kinds of things. Did that mean you didn't come to class? You showed up, right? And now you have a reference for later. So thank you for letting me stand on my soapbox a little bit on that one as well. And I'd like to wrap up and we'll open up with, uh, or we'll, we'll have about 10 minutes here for uh, Q&A. The need to make changes is not always this obvious. On the screen is a photograph that I took when I was going grocery shopping a few years ago when I lived in Chicago. I ordinarily will describe what's on the screen in this one, I want to ask you, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> People online, put it in the chat and we'll give a shout out too. What's wrong with this picture? And we won't raise hands, just shout it out here, I'll repeat it if anybody notices. Yep, in the, uh, and our colleague here in the room has it correct. Uh, anything similar online? Okay, fair. If people are typing furiously online. They're like, this is indignant, right? Um, in the United States, we don't bolt our trolley returns down to the pavement so they can be moved around. And uh, the folks at this grocery store have moved the trolley return into the accessible parking spot, meaning no one can park there. Here is the power of social media. My partner went into the store and started grocery shopping. I stood there and I took a picture with my phone and then I got on Twitter and I said, dear at name of grocery store, this is at Thomas J. Tobin. I'm at your River Forest, Illinois location. And then I went to all caps to indicate my feelings, not cool. Send five minutes later. I hadn't even picked up my vegetables yet. Buzz, buzz, buzz in my pocket. It's a tweet from corporate. Dear at Thomas J. Tobin, indeed not cool. We're calling the store manager right now. Yes. I did a little dance right there in the aisle. I had done something good for the world. It was fantastic. And then I came out, and indeed, someone was parked there. I took another photograph. If you're wondering, where's the little wheelchair icon on the license tag? Uh, in Illinois, we used hang tags on the mirror. I checked. And I had done something good for the world until I recognized 
that they had just moved the trolley return into the striped part of the pavement so this person couldn't open their doors. What's my point? If you try to take on everything all at once, all the good ideas you're going to hear throughout the symposium, you'll get overloaded and you won't even do one thing. Take progress over perfection. Take one action, try one thing. Even if it doesn't go the way you wanted it to go, you will learn about how you interact with your students. Lower those barriers. Keep the rigor high for your content. Lower those access barriers wherever you find them. How do you know where they are? Ask your students. An anonymous poll in the VLE can do wonders for you to learn what the challenges are that they are facing. So on your screen now is a man with a beard and a microphone standing on a box in a public square in Boston, Massachusetts. This is called Bug House Square. Anyone can stand up and talk about anything they want. I want you now, friends online, people who've watched the recording, colleagues in the room, I want you now to go and be my secret, sneaky evangelists. Share these ideas with other people when you go to your staff meeting or your faculty colloquium, just sit back and say, you know, I made this one change, and now I don't have to reteach that difficult concept in week three. And then just sit there, they'll come to you. What did you do? I, I have that same problem. And then you have a conversation. I'll also give a plug here at UCD, the resource hub has a toolkit for you for being inclusive in your scenario. Universal Design for Learning curriculum, assessment and feedback packs. So take a look at that when we're done with our symposium here. And to wrap us up, let's do a lightning round. People online, post this in the chat and we'll give voice to as many of them as we can. On your screen is the kind of takeaways that I like. This is guacamole and salsa and chips and elotes, the, the Mexican street corn, and a liter margarita in a jar. This is the kind of takeaway that I like. But let's think about the other kind of takeaway. What's one thing that you will take away from our session today? One thing, big or small. Just key it into the chat. We've already got a few of them, please. We already had one before you even asked. Oh, that's awesome. Um, that try one thing. Try one thing, keep them coming. Oh, don't try to do everything. Don't try to do everything. By the way, we remember the ends of things more than we remember the beginnings. <laughs> What's one thing you're taking away from today? Just raise a hand, shout it out, and I'll re-say it. Oh, pausing, being comfortable with silence for more than the traditional six seconds. So being a listening person when you're advocating for universal design for learning at a systemic level. Coordinating, co coalition all those. Coordinating and, and, and working with your, your colleagues. Splendid. What's one thing? Consult your students. Consult your students. Ask them what's going on in their lives. Progress over perfection. Take progress over perfection. Everybody has challenges. Everybody has challenges. So be, be open to working with them. Dare to trust your students. Dare to trust your students. I love it. And that is a wonderful note for us to end on today.